So, um, it's tariffs, it's border controls, it's a whole caboodle, really. They're all the administrative tasks that are going to be revolutionized for um, exporters and for importers as well. Um, uh, our experts are going to explore um, the current state of negotiations uh, and, and this frictionless word is going to come up, I suspect, again and again and again. Uh, the current state of negotiations, and I suppose to an extent as well, the, the various possible outcomes that we can uh, get to. So, uh, Penny, I think you're going to kick us off after you. Pe Penny Todd, from, uh, who's UK Customs Supervisor for the Ford Motor Company. Hello. So, my day-to-day -day job is looking after customs imports and exports between non-EU countries and the UK here. Um, but increasingly, more and more of my time is taken up with dealing with planning for Brexit and dealing with the EU. So this topic is uh, obviously very relevant and one that uh, I talk about a lot at work. Um, I think top of Ford's wish list and top of most of the industry would be that we continue to have um, free trade flows between the UK and the EU, that we don't have friction at the border, but that we get um, goods moving in the same way as they do today, without having to stop and do customs clearances. However, we have to plan for the worst. So for us, we are planning what happens if we have a hard border. And by a hard border, I mean that we have to do import declarations when goods arrive into the UK or into the EU from the UK. And we have to have export declarations as well. Um, and so then we have to start talking about what does this mean? So we need to look at the knock-on costs that that involves, you know, the cost of having um, agents and, uh, at the border, the brokers who do the declarations for you, the cost of having in-house staff to manage the processes for you. Um, we're also looking at what's the administrative burden of having to do this, the data you have to provide, the paperwork, what IT systems do you need to have in place to manage these processes, um, and, and the cost that goes with having that IT system as well. Um, and one of the biggest concerns for us relates to delays at the border. So we're very concerned if having to do import and export declarations results in vehicles being stopped at the border, delays building up, you know, the operation stack type of scenarios that we, we've seen. So we are um, trying to understand how we can get frictionless trade as much as possible um, so that we don't have to cope with increased haulage costs, with increased number of trailers we require, the racking for the, the parts, warehousing costs, all those kind of related costs that will be impacted if we get delays at the border. Um, the, the UK government has given us two options, the uh, new customs partnership, which effectively means um, that the UK authorities act as a kind of agent on behalf of the EU. So goods that come into the UK, the appropriate duties, the appropriate customs procedures will be applied so that if they flow onto the EU, that there's no issue. Um, we don't really know the technicalities about what that involves. Um, we've been given some hints and ideas, but it seems quite burdensome at the moment. So we are struggling to understand exactly what that means. Um, the second option is the sort of streamlined customs approach, which is uh, max fax, as it's referred to, or maximum facilitation. So trying to put in place uh, systems and processes at the, uh, the ports that allow the goods to move freely and don't cause the delays. Um, the issue we have with that, I think, is time, because that involves infrastructure, it involves IT systems, it involves changes to border force and HMRC processes, to, to business processes. And so for us, um, I think the transition period is key. You know, December 2020 doesn't look very far away at all. March 2019 looks quite terrifying. So um, for us, it's making sure we've got a long enough transition period that allows everybody to, to respond. Um, for us, you know, Ford, we know how to do imports and exports. We're a global company. That, that's my day job. So if we have to do that with the EU, then it's a case of just more of the same and it's resource implications that are involved. But we know there are many businesses out there, some of them will be within the automotive supply chain, that have never done um, import and export declarations. All their trade is with the EU, they've never had to deal with these formalities before. So we are um, trying to understand what, you know, how, that can, how we can help them and what that means. 
So for us, it is key, definitely, to have frictionless trade as much as possible. Right, OK, which is a, a, a word, as I say, we're going to hear again and again over the next half hour or so. Stephen uh, Freesmith is Customs Manager for BMW. Yes. Also, warm, welcome from my side. I have to start the presentation. Let me show it on the screen. Hold on. Pause for a second, because I think it will come in a... My experience of these things is no. always... A then, I start, people then I start talking. <laughs> yeah. uh, of course, uh, BMW, we are in a similar... Oh, great. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, BMW, we are in a similar position and, uh, that, as Ford, and uh, from our perspective, the UK, of course, is a very important sales market. Is, it is our fourth biggest sales market uh, from a sales perspective, but what is very important from our perspective, the UK is also a place of production. We have four production plants in the UK. We have uh, engine production at Hamshall. We have two car production plants with good wood where we are producing the Rolls Royce. At Oxford, we are producing the Mini. And of course, we have also a pressing plant at Swindon where we are producing all the press pressing parts, not only for the Mini, also for the BMW production for the one series and for the two series. So we are in a very difficult and specific situation because uh, the production plants uh, the UK production plants don't stand alone. They are not producing local by local. This means they are highly integrated in our European production network where goods are crossing multiple times the borders, where subsequent processing levels took place on both sides of the upcoming uh, customs border between the UK and the European Union. Which is also very interesting to see that uh, our UK plants are in maturity, are producing for exporting goods. Uh, if you have a look to, Exford, to Oxford, where we're producing the Mini, only 20% of all produced Minis in Oxford are remaining in the UK market. All the rest is exported to the European mainland or to the rest of the world. And that's the way production works at BMW. Uh, if we go more in detail to the uh, customs and logistic processes, um, we, we have seen or we are realizing that currently around about 150 trucks are arriving, coming from the European, uh, from the European mainland, arriving at our UK plants, and these trucks are transporting only production materials and components. And for these trucks, uh, in future, if we have a customs border, um, we will have to make a customs clearance. We have to clear it for export from the export perspective on and uh, on the other side, uh, from an import perspective, also we have to clear the goods for import. Uh, in the other direction, around about 100 trucks, are, 120 trucks are leaving our UK plants in direction to the European mainland. And also for these trucks, we have to do customs clearance in future. And um, because I want to give you an impression, because uh, sometimes. Uh, Customs union, free trade agreement, third country party scenario is mixed with customs clearance. It doesn't matter how the future trade relationship will look like. At the end, we will have a customs border where we have to clear goods for customs purpose, even if we don't pay customs duties, for example, in the event of a customs union. And that's something we have to prepare. And of course, we know that there will be an additional volume, an extra extra volume of, of, of shipments which have to be cleared for customs purposes at the ports, at Eurotunnel, and we know that uh, customs clearance in average takes more than 20 seconds time, and uh, so uh, I, I'm afraid that there will be delays at, uh, at the ports, um, especially um, we're not afraid of physical checks because if we look in the past, uh, customs uh, don't perform physical checks for every consignment, but the pure administration for clearing the goods, this takes time. That's time con also time consuming. Even if there is a delay of five minutes, there will be delays at the border, and that's something we have to sort out. To give you an impression uh, about our supplier network, because uh, I already mentioned that we are preparing the worst case. Worst case means that we will have customs clearance at the upcoming border uh, between the European Union and uh, the UK. And that's the way we are also pre preparing our supplier network. 
This means we started last year together with our consultant partner Deloitte to make uh, a survey within our supplier network. We ask uh, 1,600 suppliers who have transactions with the UK if they are ready for Brexit, if they have customs expertise, if they have uh, in-house customs expertise, if they're using customs brokers, if they're using simplified procedures, all this custom stuff, we ask them and we get got a really good insight into the supplier network. But from our perspective, of course, it was a little bit frustrating because we have had to realize that in average, only 50% of the supplier network has experience of clearing goods for customs purpose. All the rest has not sufficient expertise because in the past, there was no need for dealing with this customs stuff because these suppliers had only transactions within the European Union, and so there was no need to have an internal customs office or for using a customs broker and all these things. And uh, based on the research of uh, the survey, uh, we made the decision that we have to prepare our supplier network. And so we started to inform our supplier network how they have to prepare for Brexit, uh, how they can apply for using simplifications in customs clearance, also how they can apply, for example, to get an authorized economic operator and all these things. And additionally, um, to, the, to providing inf informal material to the supplier network, we started to perform supplier days uh, where we invited all our suppliers uh, to join us for one day where we educated them the basics of customs clearance, where we give, gave them an insight of the ongoing negotiations and uh, how they have, of course, how they have to prepare for, for Brexit. And um, in consequence to the supplier days, we collected all the questions of our supplier network and uh, um, we are in direct communication with all of our suppliers to give them the answers they are needing for preparing for Brexit. Hmm. Tim, thank you very much uh, for that. We'll come back to a couple of points that you raised as well in a moment. Let's turn to John Keefe, who's UK Director of Public Affairs for Eurotunnel. Good afternoon. Uh, I think the first confession should be we are neither a motor manufacturer nor a motor trader, um, but we do play a fairly uh, critical role in the supply chain that links organisations across uh, between the UK and the EU. We've been in business for about 24 years, and interestingly, we were created uh, after the customs union had been formed, and at the principle of our operation is to be a rolling motorway. A rolling motorway is entirely possible. It exists in every country. Most of them are roads. Uh, you drive a truck along them um, from one point of part of departure to uh, a destination. Ours happens to have a little bit of train action in the middle where you drive your truck onto a train and then we transport you across. We run eight departures per hour. Each train can carry 32 trucks. We're running something like 250 trucks in and out of the UK, 250 in each <clears throat> direction, every hour at peak. Those trucks are carrying the goods that uh, we've been talking about here all day that are coming across the border. Today, there isn't a, um, a f any friction at that border because it is largely intra-European. It works in the same way as driving a truck across the border between Belgium and Holland, or Holland and Germany, or France and Belgium. There's a road that goes through an imaginary line and nothing happens. It's exactly the same as doing that because there is a road that goes through an imaginary line between France and the UK. It's a land border. Some people say the only land border the UK has with the EU is in Ireland. There's actually a physical land border you can take a step across at the Channel Tunnel. And it's a juxtaposed border. It's a border that is slightly unusual in worldwide international trade terms because the exit and entry point are only about 50 metres apart. So a truck rolling uh, down the motorway from uh, London, down the M20 towards Folkestone, um, goes through our check-in, goes through the UK outbound border, 
and about 50 meters long later goes through the French inbound border, the EU border, the entry point into the Schengen area and into the EU um, uh, market um, for, for goods. And coming back the other way, um, goods coming up the motorway from southern Europe or from uh, the east uh, come along the A16 motorway and into, first of all, our check-in and then into the French outbound border and then into the UK inbound border whilst geographically still in France. And this is critical because when we start, when we hear words like as frictionless as possible from ministers, um, we have to think about what would the tiniest grain of sand do in a border which is only about 50 metres separated. If you compare it to an international deep sea containerized border where the, the goods are um, exported um, uh, some weeks before they're imported, if they're coming from uh, the Asia Pacific region, it might take four to six weeks for the ship to arrive. So they can be exported, um, they can be pre declared by, into the custom systems, and then a few weeks later they arrive at a port in the UK. Um, they are registered into the, uh, the port's community system and the process of customs clearance begins. The goods can then be left on the dock. You can unload a container from a ship and you can store it on the hard standing and you can allow customs officials time to come and inspect the goods if they need to or simply to, to arrange for them to be collected and, uh, and moved on. At the Channel Tunnel, there is no space. It's built to represent, to, to resemble a motorway. So the, if you stop one truck, there's another truck behind it. If you take two or three minutes to inspect a vehicle, there's nowhere else for the vehicle behind it to go. Now, some people will say, oh my goodness, Operation Stack straight away. Who cares about Operation Stack? That's not where the problem actually is. The problem is that the goods in those trucks shouldn't be sitting at a border being inspected. They should be in your factories. They are just-in-time goods. They're the goods that you've uh, ordered through your supply chain to be delivered at a particular moment in time, and they need to be there. That's why you use our service, because if the truck arrives a few minutes late, it's not a problem. It doesn't have to wait hours to get onto a ferry or onto a container ship. There's another departure going in just a few minutes, and it will meet your delivery timescale. It's because you run just in sequence. Just in time is now old hat. Um, we're moving on to the, uh, a completely different world. In the 24 years the Channel Tunnel has been in operation, the ability to operate the economy at the speed that the motor industry does has been created. It didn't exist before. Now, I'm not taking all the credit for that by having the Channel <laughs> Tunnel built and, and operating it the way we do. But inevitably, it's an important part of it. And just going into a little bit of consumer stuff, we're starting to see a, a, an economy growing with the um, postal courier segment, which is even bigger than just the automotive industry in, in our business, although within it there's an enormous amount of automotive product going backwards and forwards. But it's the just-when-I-need-it economy, the ability to shop online, to buy things today and have them delivered tomorrow or even this afternoon, the one million Amazon parcels that go through the Channel Tunnel on a daily basis. It's those kind of steps, just in time, just in sequence, just when I need it, that have become the economy that we're all used to today, the economy that our customers are used to. You are our customers. Your customers are also our customers because they're ordering cars from you and they're ordering um, other um, more personalised items through Amazon for, through us. It's £138 billion pounds worth of goods that go through the channel every year. Interestingly, there's not a trade imbalance with the EU. It's, a, it's an equal trade in and out of the country. It's about €69 billion Euros worth of goods in each direction through the channel tunnel because that speed is just as vital for the sale of our goods to markets in the EU as it is for the importation of components and finished products into the, the UK. And as Stefan said, there's also a lot of circularity in the business that goes backwards and forwards because 
there are components that are being uh, improved and, and finished um, in several different places around Europe that is made possible because the goods can be, the components can be transferred so quickly through the, the open, frictionless border and through that con continuous flow of traffic that goes through the Channel Tunnel. Now, interestingly, we run the Channel Tunnel. We, we run the bit that actually manages and organises the trains, takes the trucks through, takes you through on holidays as well, by the way. Um, but we live with the border authorities on our terminals. They live in tiny spaces. They've got little huts. And uh, on the UK side, the French have two inspection bays for trucks that they need to look inside. Two. If, it, if we get to a situation where we need to be stopping trucks, where the border is, has a degree of friction in it, only two trucks out of the 250 going through that terminal every hour could be inspected at any one time. Well, how long does an inspection take? Well, who knows? Um, this is the kind of information we don't yet have. You've got information, you've got data about the goods that are being transported in your vehicles. Um, some of you have got authorised economic operator status. Um, many of you run highly sophisticated inventory systems. Um, most of you trade with the rest of the world. And so the idea of customs isn't new, and the idea of using systems to manage customs isn't new. The trouble is, we don't know what the customs arrangements will be and how they will be applied between the UK and the EU. And that vital piece of information is the, the bit that makes this whole thing um, succeed or fail. So Until we have that... I'm, I'm going to... Can, can I ask you to pause there? Because, I mean, it, it, it is the point until we have that. Um, but that will be something that we can turn to in, in questions. I'm keen to, to get Richard as well and to, and to um, move on to, to questions. So thank you for that, um, John. Richard Ballantyne, give us the perspectives from the port. Well, thanks, Justin. Um, it's great to go last on this panel session when all these eloquent speakers have basically just covered all the bullet points I've referred. So <laughs> that's fine. Perhaps they all want to take <laughs> out my job. We can leave I mean, it there. Penny, I'll just start, Penny, by saying, you, you mentioned before it's becoming like a kind of a full-time job for you and everything. Welcome to my world. This has been, <laughs> since 2016, it's been, you know, it's the only show for the ports, really. Um, I'll just um, elaborate slightly on what John was saying about border processes. The ports industry handles about 95% of our trade, and um, a lot of that is through bulk and container terminals, who will be largely unaffected by Brexit, so they're relatively calm about it. Um, notwithstanding the impact of tariffs and you know, the economic impacts, the freight going through those terminals um, will be under undertaking through uh, processes and procedures that they're used to handling you know, customs and, and other, and other uh, processes there. But on the RORO port side, so there's the roll-on, roll-off rate port side, so this is very similar to Eurotunnel, this is the likes of Dover, Holyhead, Immingham, uh, Portsmouth, uh, and about 35 terminals in the UK. It's about 25% of our trade, and it's over half of our trade with the EU. So this is essentially, as John was saying, this is where lorries drive up with the, with the commodities on board, going back and forth between Europe. There's th tens of thousands of lorry movements a day, so to introduce a stoppage there, a check, could be substantially challenging, to say the least. Um, that, is, that is taking up a lot of the time of the, of the, the, the ports industry, obviously, and government is looking at that. Um, it's much more, and Stefan was teasing at this slightly, it's much more of, uh, of a concern say, than, say, tariffs, which I thought at the beginning after the referendum would be a huge issue for the ports industry. But notwithstanding the audience here in your industry, uh, a lot of the other um, tariff rates are relatively low. And because they are a fiscal transaction, they're not conditional on entry into the UK, collected away from the border, the ports industry are, you know, I have to say, it's, it's not the number one concern. So if drawing it back to the, the, the customs uh, uh, point, I think we've kind of covered most of the items through our other speakers, Justin. So. Yeah. No, OK. Well, and let me at that stage throw it open too, because we've got 10 minutes or so before we, we draw things to a close and go straight down to our first questioner down here. We'll just get the microphone to you. Here we go. Um, this may be a very naive point, uh, question, but when you have the lorry either on the ferry or in the tunnel, you've got it captive for 
25, 28 minutes, and maybe in your case, hours. And with the proportion of tr containers that are checked, as I understand it, why can we not check what we're going to check while, it, while, the, while the container is held while it's traveling? Good. Yeah, Go well, first. each of you. I think Just, you yeah, and your channel as well. You first. It, it, as Penny mentioned, the two customs models that have been mooted by the UK government last summer, the MaxFax and the new customs partnership, the MaxFax is essentially what we have today for non uh, row reports or anything outside the EU, um, but with, with of IT solutions. And th that is essentially one of the options that the, the, the government will be looking at. Um, you can't actually physically clear. Uh, under UK law, you can't clear, customs clear anyway, prior to arrival into the UK, but you could probably collect a lot of the information and get basically get the ball rolling. So it is definitely an option, but it, it will take a big culture shift. You know, there's IT in, uh, investment required there. The haulage industry, the freight industry, will, will be required to submit a lot of the information in advance, which it doesn't currently do now. Um, I mean, without getting, too ex getting people too excited, a lot of lorry drivers are literally just A to B. Uh, drivers, you know, they don't necessarily know exactly what they're carrying in their lorries, unless it's hazardous or dangerous, where they have to declare it. Most most drivers will just have a rough idea what they're carrying and where it's going to. So to expect them and their haulage firms and the, the freight agents to submit this information, it takes a, takes a lot of time and, and, and a long change. So, you know, systems will be need, need to be designed and installed. The carriers and the, the ports will need to work together to work out who's going to collect what and who's going to submit it to the HMRC for clearance. So, yes, it's, it's possibly a long-term yeah. option, but not, not, not available immediately. John? Um, the, the, the simple answer is they're already in the UK when they're in the tunnel. They've already been through the border. Um, so the, the, the clearance transaction um, it, it takes place at the border point, which is before you, you load onto the tunnel. The other interesting thing about the tunnel, of course, is it's underground and uh, data connectivity isn't brilliant um, down there. So if you're taking 250 sets of data and sending them in, in real time, that, that might be a, a, an interesting challenge. Um, but but it, the, the, the principle isn't wrong. The, you know, if we have information pre-declared and it's triggered at the point of crossing, then of course all of this is happening in the cloud somewhere. And if it is only transactional and it doesn't need to be dealt with in a physical check uh, sense, then during the journey is when the, uh, the transaction should be occurring. Mm. Um, the, 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 the problem is if friction means inspection, then we have to have space for inspection. And in the, uh, in the, the tunnel and in the port of Dover's uh, context, there is no space. Um, they, they are literally, interesting actually, on the cliff edge because that's where they, they sit. Yeah. Um, so there, there, there isn't any space to do that. So there'd have to be some form of inland um, uh, space We'd created. Blow up the cliff, but that wouldn't send out the right <laughs> message or anything. Yeah. yeah, thanks, just, just building a bit on what um, uh, John was saying there. Um, it's not just customs checks, of course. Leaving the single market means that a lot of the cargo and goods coming in and out of the UK will be subject to new single market related checks, port and animal. Uh, sorry, plant and animal health checks, which I think Chris Giles alluded to earlier. Mm. And those kind of checks can be quite intrusive, actually. I mean, that, that they're prescribed under EU rules, uh, and that could be, you know, that could be beef consignments in containers that need to be open and visually inspected, etc. What also it could mean, perhaps more relevant to you, is, is leather. I mean, those kind of products, if they're coming in and out, that, that might need further inspections and... Uh, probably not quite as, um, the, the, the Port Health Inspector won't trawl through them quite as much as they would with, with beef from Argentina, for example. But it does represent a delay, and of course that means cost. Yeah. Okay, I'll throw it open again. Uh, anyone got anything else to say? We haven't even talked about VAT yet, which was brought up very interestingly earlier on. Gentlemen down here, if we could bring, the, bring it down to, to him. Here we go. Mike Bourne to an SMMT. Um, Stefan eloquently explained the issues for BMW. I'm not getting the impression from ports or Eurotunnel that there's any sort of contingency planning going on. Please allay my concerns on that. <laughs> if, uh, John. I'll, I'll start with that. We, we, the, the day after the referendum, um, we engaged with the, uh, the government to ask them politely uh, what was the plan. Um, and we've spent 
probably the, the well, we, we have spent the last two years, to, almost to the day, um, educating government, um, uh, whether that's MPs, ministers, officials, um, simply about what happens, how trade works, what goes backwards and forwards, how much of it goes backwards and forwards, how fast most of it goes backwards and forwards. Because the, the, the position that we were getting at the time was so vague as to be completely unworkable. And that, that process of education and, and a series of discussions has brought us closer to a, 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 a point where there is a degree of understanding but I think, I think we've, we've all seen from the, the, the confusion that we read about in the, the newspapers, which the government say is just noise and not very much heat, um, the, that they are, you know, they are moving towards a, a positive position. In, in terms of what we can do in contingency planning, there are, there are really two options. There's, there's, nothing happens, in which case our contingency plan is, has always been there. Get ready for a deal, or, or, or a change, rather. And the change is either day one, no deal, in which case that's the 29th of March, it's about nine months away, and as we know absolutely nothing from the government about what that will look like, we can't build infrastructure, we can't recruit people, we can't uh, specify systems. So we're waiting for that specification from them as to how that might work if we were to be able to, to deliver anything. And then b between day one no deal and remaining in the customs union and remaining in the single market, there is such a vast gap that you, you could take a point at any point position along that, that line and say, well, th this is our contingency plan and be wrong every single time. So contingency planning is more of an intellectual process at the moment. It's trying to understand all of the different options and possibilities and know that in certain we would have to invest money and in others we wouldn't and simply be ready with the checkbook. Mm. But at the moment, we can't construct anything. I think I would add, though, I think, you know, a lot of the contingency planning has to be done by business. Um, from a customer's point of view, HMRC are going to be coming to you to pay any duties and tariffs that are owed. You have the responsibility to do the import and the export declarations. So it's on the businesses to be um, prepared that they can do the export declarations. They've gone out to a broker. They've got them appointed. They've got the right systems in place to manage this. They um, know how to deal with HMRC. They've got the authorizations they might need to manage their business. Um, you know, and HMRC do provide a lot of simplifications to manage your import and export process, but you have to go through an authorization process to get that, and it's, you know, it takes months and months. So then the question is, have HMRC and Border Force got the right resources and people in place? Um, you know, if we end up with March 2019, that's, as you said, nine months. That's not very long in terms of applying for authorizations, like the simplified procedures, the inward processing reliefs, the outward processing reliefs, and, and all these kind of um, simplifications that business can take advantage of. So I think that the contingency planning needs to be done by business, and it needs to be started now in case we do get to a March 2019 no-deal scenario. Um, and even if you look at you know, December 2020, that is just not far away. If you need to go out and, and engage with brokers, if you need to get IT systems, because all you do at the moment is um, EU business, and I think HMRC themselves have estimated something like 140,000, 150,000 businesses in the UK only deal with the EU. They don't know how to do declarations. So where is the, the workforce going to come from that's going to do those declarations? Where is the HMRC personnel going to come from that can manage that process? that can put through all those authorizations and, and um, help business in this. Mm. Can, I, can I just- Very briefly, just, yeah. Just briefly, thank you, Justin. Just to add, I mean, yeah, it's a, um, how, how do you plan for something you don't know what to plan for? That's the, the big challenge. And as John alluded to, um, you're not gonna invest in something until you know what you need to invest in. Uh, and ports are commercial entities, they're competitive. They're not gonna commit anything just yet until they know the nature of the final deal. We have as an industry written to the prime minister, I'm sure she's 
gets written to regularly by lots of concerned no, no, she associations. Looks for your letters, I and, um, <laughs> well, she's replied actually, but uh, she, we wrote to her recently about um, uh, requesting that the money um, earmarked, the three billion earmarked in the uh, the budget last November for Brexit contingency planning, should be allocated. Some of which should be allocated towards borders infrastructure and staffing. But um, we're waiting further discussion on that. So. Right. Okay. Uh, there's a question of a lady up in the, in the corner there next to the TV camera. Hold on one second. We'll get it round, and then we're going to have to bring things to a close, I think. So here we go. <clears throat> Hello. It's Lisa O'Carroll from The Guardian. It's a question for Penny. Um, just two quick questions. What do you think um, the extra cost, for, given that we all assume that there will be some extra cost from Brexit, will mean to the consumers, the price of a car? Um, and secondly, what are Ford's <coughs> contingency plans? Do you have options like BMW to shift, if they need to, to shift production in the event of massive uh, disruption in October? So in terms of um, cost, you know, obviously when you do a declaration at the border, there is a cost associated with it. You have to pay an agent to do that broker for you. Um, you probably have staff. You know, we, I have a team who manage customs for me at Ford. I'm going to have to expand that to be able to cope with the volume of transactions if we have to do EU customs declarations. So... As a business, we either have to suck up that cost, you know, and, and we've already spent a significant amount of money um, implementing a new custom system. Um, so business either sucks that up or they have to pass it on to the consumer. Um, if we fall into a no-deal scenario and we have no tariff arrangements, so we have to start paying duty on vehicles, you know, it's 10% per vehicle. So it then starts to become quite difficult for business to suck up a 10% cost and not pass that on to the consumer. I, I'm not involved in the pricing of vehicles, but you know, I, I can see that that is a considerable cost for a company to, um, to suck up. In terms of Ford's um, investment plans, I'm, I only look after customs, so I don't have privy to uh, what they're doing in terms of investment in the UK. Um, I don't believe there's any change to our existing plans. We are still investing in our um, engine plants in Bridgend and Dagenham. We still have um, a strong engineering research um, centre in, uh, in Dunson, in Essex. There's no plans to change that at the moment. Um, so, you know, it's, but who knows what Brexit will bring? Who knows what Brexit will bring? Final words for our conference today, at least from our <laughs> panellists uh, for this session. Thank you all very much indeed. Brilliant. <laughs>